This talk is called 1.5 Locked In, 28 Locked Up. So tonight we will be discussing the death project that is being forced upon us by those in positions of power and honouring those who understand their moral duty and have been resisting against it. We have found ourselves in the most significant point in human history through no fault of our own, standing on the precipice of, so of social and ecological annihilation. But those who have the privilege of knowing have the duty to act. This is exactly why everyone here must push into courage and do something they physically and mentally can to stop this death project and to turn the tables on those who have sentenced us to death just so they can ensure a couple more zeros at the end of their bank statement. As the name of this event states, in the UK there are many people who have understood their duty and are being held as political prisoners, simply for trying to secure a livable future for us all. If the government acted with the same integrity as these individuals, we would not be forced to take action. The names of everybody in prison are as follows. Al Wilcox, Alfie Beswick, Callum Good, Catherine Rennie Nash, Daniel Shaw, Ian Bates, Isabel Rock, Jan Goody, Roger Hallam, Karen Matthews, Lucia Whitaker de Abra, Maya Bain, Molly Berry, Nick Onley, Pasha Bell, Paul Bleach, Phoebe Plummer, Samuel Price, Tez Burns, Reverend Tem Tim Hughes, Morgan Troland, Marcus Decker, Elliot Kikurian, Josh Smith, and Louis McKechnie. I was actually in court today and I saw quite a number of those people, which was very emotional. It was lovely to see them after weeks of them being on remand, still awaiting trial. It looks as though many of them will remain in prison on remand until potentially May 2023. And there are many other people who have been released from prison who are still on ankle tags as I'm doing this now I'm actually charging myself I'm on an ankle tag bound to Harpenden many of us are not actually free and uh, we may remain this way until 2024. So the United Nations has stated that there is no credible pathway to 1.5 degrees straight from the horse's mouth we are hearing what individuals and climate groups have been shouting about for years under this current system we are beyond fucked. In fact, even during the 2015 Paris Agreement that committed countries to staying under 1.5 degrees of global warming, that was a complete facade of greenwash. An article published in The Conversation stated that no scientist at the Paris Agreement thought we could stay below 1.5 degrees within this system, a system that requires infinite growth on a finite planet that holds the value of money over the value of human and animal life, ecology and reality. This is the death project. And if we don't destroy it, then we will lose everything. We have received a message from our friend Noam Chomsky to be read out in this event. And it goes as follows. We are racing to a precipice from which there will be no return. Global heating is approaching irreversible tipping points. There is a narrow window within which we can carry out feasible programs to avert catastrophe and open the way to a survivable, indeed improved life. The opportunities are fading away because of lack of will and commitment. There are a distinguished few who are dedicating themselves to saving the human species from its folly, facing the risks that are the price of integrity and courage. Roger Hallam and his associates are prominent among them. They deserve our praise and our full support for courageously leading the way to survival. So since April, the Just Up Oil supporters have taken action all over the country, at oil terminals, on the streets, at petrol stations, on motorways, in art galleries, in sport arenas, on bridges, the list continues. Thousands of people have been arrested. The spirit of the regular people when faced with existential threat is more powerful than the project that is causing this threat. And the supporters of Just Stop Oil have proven this. 
we've had over half a year of consistent and sometimes non-stop action. And like the climate, we're only just warming up. <laughs> so I'll just introduce myself briefly. So my name's Louise Harris, I'm 24 years old. Uh, some of you may recognize me from <laughs> crying on top of a gantry on the M25. Uh, shout out to the Daily Mail and the Sun <laughs> for bigging me up on that. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been arrested um, five times with Just Up Oil since uh, about March this year. I spent eight days in Bronzefield Prison uh, last month and I'm now on an ankle tag bound to my hometown. Um, so yeah, that is me. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're really excited to be joined by such an incredible panel tonight. So we have the co-founder of Beyond Politics and former London mayoral candidate, Valerie Brown, the international human rights lawyer and director of Plan B, Tim Crosland, former Paralympian, James Brown, and professor of theology, Carmody Gray. We would also like to express condolences that Chris Hedges has had to pull out of this evening's event due to unforeseen circumstances, but we will have him on at another event. So keep an ear out for that. And we are also delighted to welcome a member from Just Up Oil, Gabby. Um, she will be offering an invaluable personal insight into why she is part of Just Stop Oil and why she has been playing a part in this movement, which hopefully allows you to realize the impact that you can have, both as an individual as well as a collective. Change is initiated by brave individuals standing up for what they believe in. And it is through each one of these individual decisions that we can create mass movements and stimulate cultural change. Throughout tonight's talk, we will be reminding you how you can get involved and what you can do to help tackle the climate crisis right now. So please follow the links at the bottom of the screen and in the talk description to donate and or sign up for action. So there's three key pathways to action. So number one, donate. So you can give what you earn in one hour as a once a month donation to help the hundreds of people who need support as they mobilize people up and down the country to fight on the front lines. We have raised half a million pounds already, but we need more people to support us to raise another million. You could help us raise what we need. Another way is to act. So take part in civil disobedience yourself. That will start by you attending a non-violence training if you haven't already. And that is relevant to all non-violent non forms of direct action, not just Just Up Oil. And the final way is to support. So the people getting arrested on the front lines can't do what they do without the amazing people working in the background behind the scenes. Support roles include mobilization, for example, leafleting or ringing people up, as well as police station support, prison support and helping with fundraising. So during this talk and particularly towards the end, there will be a poll where you can vote for what way you would like to engage um, in this project. And um, yeah, we will be doing breakout rooms at the end where you can discuss what you think you would be up for doing. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Valerie Brown. So Valerie Brown is a mother and a grandmother who has spent the last few years fighting against corporate and governmental corruption. She first took action after trying to create change within the rules of the current system, but realized that the only way to create change was by not playing by these rules. She has upcoming trials for notable actions such as cracking the window at the HSBC building in Canary Wharf. She also ran for London mayor with the Burning Pink Party, aiming at replacing the London Assembly with a legally binding Citizens Assembly. So welcome, Valerie. No, I was just saying that I've heard so much about you and I've not met you. And um, you are a legend at 24. It's amazing. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. Um, you know, you were saying, you used, you asked the question, you know, why? Or, or in the video, I think it was saying, you know, why is all this happening? And um, I'd like to try to answer that question a little bit, although to be honest with you, I think we're all kind of like um, absolutely <laughs> in pretty well in the dark and confused about why the leaders of our world should just stand by and just watch us lose everything, you know, and including them too. But, you know, when I had um, some, my second generation of children in the 19 late 1980s and when they were little kind of toddlers around 1991 and stuff 
um, you know, like all moms, you know, you, you, you have to cook and do housework and whatever. So I sometimes occasionally put them in front of the television um, so that, you know, to distract them so I could get on with something for a moment. Every now and again, I'd pop into the living room to check on them. And they were watching children's television. But I noticed that there were so many adverts um, for babies' television, advert upon advert. And then um, around the early 1990s, I switched off the TV, never to switch it on again. I thought to myself, this isn't right. I noticed that when I went to the supermarket, I suddenly saw that um, young children, you know, five, six-year-olds were busy tugging at their, their, their parents' clothes because they wanted stuff. You know, teenagers were all sort of bragging and sporting the latest you know, fashions, trainers, and then later on came the mobile phones and parents felt this need uh, to, to keep up with everything, talk about keeping up with the Joneses, to buy their children the latest of everything. I mean, this is the famous uh, consumer society that just went rampant from the 1990s. I mean, obviously it was there before, but it wasn't like that. And um, it's rapidly taken us to this point where we are all having to fight for our futures. But I feel that, you know, it, although I've done actions and, and so on, and I've done them when I first joined XR, I was actually ready to die. If my life could make a difference to anything at all, it was worth it. And I understood people like Martin Luther King and you know, Malcolm X and you know, uh, Nelson Mandela and so on, who put their lives completely on the line. Um, but I do feel as time has gone on that we have to reach the ordinary people. I know some people don't like the word ordinary, the everyday people, just you know, us ordinary people. We have to reach them because that consumerism stuff that I was talking about just a while ago, along with social media, computers, the need to find happiness through buying stuff, having the latest of everything, has basically taken control of our ability to think and to reflect on every aspect of what we do. And I feel more and more that, you know, as time, because when I was young, there were stars in the sky at night. If it was a clear day in London, you could see stars at night. You didn't have to go too far really to see nature. But now, it, not just in London, but all over the world, in countries in Africa, in cities in Africa, they've just lost touch with nature itself. So, um, yeah. So we are so far removed from the things that gave us time to reflect. People are all walking around with these Bluetooth things in their ears. So they're constantly plugged into some distraction, constantly. How in heaven's name can we begin to understand and take in and even all the amazing actions, the courage that everybody's showing trying to save this planet, trying to save humanity. We have to reach the people. And I feel very strongly that getting out there and talking to people about a new vision of democracy, a new vision about how we can find ourselves again. The journey to saving the planet is actually to save ourselves, to find our souls, our spirit, our minds, our humanity. So citizens' assemblies, you know, and deliberative democracy is a big passion of mine. I believe that reaching the people also, so that when we talk to the people about hope and vision, which is something um, politicians don't do. Politicians just talk about money as if that's going to save us. If when the money is all in the pockets of the few and taken away from the lives of the many, What's the point of them going constantly going on and on about economics, the economy? Countries are called economies. People are called consumers. We're no longer people. We're no longer 
citizens. So they're stripping us of who we really are. So through citizens' assemblies and campaigning for that, I feel that we can get out into real communities of people and discuss with them what we can do, introduce this powerful idea of democracy to them. There's no reason on earth that the world and the way we govern ourselves can't change. This has been going on for hundreds of years and it was never created for the ordinary people. It was always created for the elite. And as the years, the, the centuries have gone by, it's shown itself to be what a, a horrible um, system it really is. So we need to throw it out. And I think that people are absolutely ready to hear about change and about love, about caring for one another, about communities getting smaller, coming together and taking care of one another and getting rid of lies and deceit and greed. We've had enough. So also what the last thing I wanted to say is that citizens' assemblies also gives us um, the chance to explain to communities why people are taking action. Because I think actually a lot of the time people don't quite get it. You know, all the stuff about it's a nuisance, we can't go to work, they're blocking the roads. But if we humanely, with humanity rather, so humanity sounds like we're killing somebody, um, can get out there and have discussions with people, which gives them a new vision of life, they can also understand why activism is important and is part of this change, this journey we're all on, that we all have to take. So I think that's me, really. UK, by the way, is very low down in the happiness ratio in Europe for a country that's economically quite strong. It's pretty way down. So we need to go out there and talk to UK people that there is a chance, small chance to save our planet, a small chance or a bigger chance to find happiness. The two go together. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. I think those are really important points that you've raised, you know, the power of distraction that governments and particularly the media use, you know, people are more interested in David Beckham's new haircut than <laughs> the climate crisis that is killing all of us and absolutely the power of citizens assemblies. You know, when is the last time we had a prime minister who we actually elected? We don't even have, you know, proportional representation. So yeah, really, really key points there. Thank you very much, Valerie. Um, now I'm very happy to introduce Tim Crosland. So Tim is the director of the charity Plan B Earth, which supports and advances strategic legal action to contain dangerous climate change and ocean acidification. Plan B Earth works collaboratively and internationally to bring strategic high impact interventions and ensures that those primarily responsible for greenhouse gas emissions bear the costs of consequent loss and damage. He is also a former barrister and international human rights lawyer. So welcome, Tim. Um, thank you so much, Louise, um, and everyone who's here this evening. Um, I feel so honoured to be on a panel with people like uh, Louise and Gabby, um, who are so insp just inspiring heroes with their courage. And I'd like to begin by saying just a little bit about my own background, which explains something of my understanding about law and resistance and how that works. Um, my grandmother was a German Jew who escaped Nazi Germany to England just in time. Her father was um, Adolf Wallenberg, who was a prominent German architect, and their social circle in Germany included quite a lot of lawyers, quite a lot of judges, and she could never forgive or forget how those people that she knew, who her father had counted as his friends, had applied their legal education and expertise to legitimizing the actions of the Nazi regime. And it was not that resistance was impossible. There was a notable exception that proved the rule. Um, Lothar Kreisig, a German judge, 
1940, he'd become aware from the patterns of death certificates that were coming into his office, that um, mentally ill people under his jurisdiction were being sent away and put to their deaths. And he considered that to be unlawful. And he wrote to the court president to say so. And the president demanded that he revoke that letter, which Krasig refused. And Krasig was then ordered to speak to the Ministry of Justice. But when Krasig asked the Ministry of Justice to provide some evidence about how this killing could be lawful, the ministry was unable to do so. And then Krasig issued an order to all the institutions in his jurisdiction, banning transport of people to where the killings were being carried out. And he started proceedings for murder against those responsible for the killing. The president of the province demanded Krasig lift the ban. The Minister of Justice showed Krasig Hitler's direct approval for the killing programme but still Krasig refused to lift the ban. He said he could not accept that it was lawful. He was told that anyone who refused to recognize the will of Hitler as the highest law couldn't hold judicial office. He still refused to lift the order and he was retired with full pension rights. And he would later establish the NGO Action Reconciliation for Peace, sending volunteers to all the countries that had suffered under Nazi occupation. But if Lothar Kreisig is a story of resistance, it also reveals the bigger picture. There were 15,000 judges who served under Nazi Germany and more or less 14,999 went along with the horror. These were eminent people, highly educated in the Western tradition of the rule of law. And we might have imagined that they were under extraordinary duress, that if they disobeyed, if they didn't play along, they would have been taken out and shot. But no, Krasig got full pension rights because it was important to the German economy to maintain the independence of the rule of law. And Hitler was nervous about interfering with the judges. I've been a lawyer for nearly 30 years now. At one point I was a government lawyer. And it's central to my idea of the rule of law that genocide is abhorrent and a gross violation of the rule of law. And what is unfolding now is the genocide to end all genocides. Anyone who denies that's either deluding themselves or setting out to delude others. Um, in 2015, I was actually there at Paris. Um, Louise talked about that. I was a legal advisor to some of the small island states. And there was pressure coming from the Western governments to accept an agreement that would set the two degree target as the global limit. But my clients had got a, advice from the Potsdam Climate Institute in Germany that showed that beyond 1.5 degrees, they were facing annihilation. And so what my clients asked me, but also um, others, was how can you ask us to sign our own death warrant? How can you expect us to legitimize our own genocide, which is what we would be doing if we were signing up to two degrees? And confronted with that, like honorable, intransigence, it wasn't naive, those countries didn't believe anyone was going to save them, they just weren't going to sign up to it. The more powerful and the more influential parties like the US and the EU could either forfeit the fig leaf of an international agreement, or they could recognize that 1.5 degree threshold. And they opted to do that. And that's where the Paris Agreement came from. And initially, I think I really struggled to believe that the courts of this country were genocidal. When I set up Plan B, I thought if I presented them with the overwhelming evidence of the genocidal consequences of breaching 1.5 degrees, that they would realize that was important. But I was wrong. The problem was not with our laws. Um, 
I've now brought three cases before the British courts. And all were aimed at the same thing, ensuring the government aligned its policies to the 1.5 degree limit as part of the collective effort to resist genocide. And it wasn't that the governments or courts disputed the scientific basis of the cases. Um, just to remind people in the net zero strategy the government published last year, what the government said, people are rightly concerned that if we fail to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, floods and fires will get more frequent, more fierce, crops will fail, sea levels will drive uh, rising mass migration as millions are forced from their homes. Above 1.5 degrees, we risk reaching climatic tipping points like the melting of Arctic permafrost, meaning we lose control of our climate for good. So the government knows, government understands. Just to give you one example, um, around Heathrow, in public, the government were telling us that Heathrow expansion in the middle of the climate emergency was consistent with its climate obligations. In court, it was forced to drop that pretense because its own evidence showed there'd be 40 million tonnes of carbon emissions just from UK aviation with Heathrow expansion every year by 2050. So it made a formal admission that it had treated the Paris limit as not relevant. The Court of Appeal held the government was wrong to do that. How could it be not relevant when the government accepted that beyond that limit, whole countries, whole regions of the world would be destroyed? And then we got to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court simply changed the facts. It made a finding that the government had taken the Paris Agreement into account, even though the government had admitted that it hadn't done. And what was going on was the Supreme Court lied in order to conceal the reality, which was that the government, which was presiding over the UN COP process and claiming to be a climate leader, was knowingly pursuing a course of conduct that will annihilate whole peoples and regions of the world and which threatens to destroy the conditions which make the planet habitable. It was making itself complicit in genocide just like the courts in Nazi Germany. And now 1.5 degrees is locked in. And the science predicts that the tropical regions of the world will be too hot to live in because the wet bulb temperature will exceed 35 degrees Celsius, which is beyond the capacity of the human body to cool itself down. Tropical regions of the world, that's where 40% of the world's population live. That's more than 3 billion people. What's happening is genocide, and each of us is faced with a decision about whether to be complicit or to resist. So thank you uh, to Just Stop Oil and communities of resistance everywhere for holding to the only honourable course, which is resistance. Um, and I hope you'll be seeing more and more lawyers joining you in resistance soon, because um, if, if the rule of law doesn't mean resisting genocide, it doesn't mean anything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. That was amazing. Um, I'm going to introduce now um, James Brown. So James Brown has competed in several international competitions representing Britain and has won two gold medals in the Paralympics. In 2019, James superglued himself to the top of an aeroplane, bringing disruption to the airports, places that are a huge contributor to climate breakdown. In his words, he had to do something spectacular to bring attention to the climate crisis. In October of 2021, he was sentenced to a year in jail for this action. So James, could you tell us how you first heard about the crisis and what was your response to it? Uh, I just need to explain why I'm in bed because that's probably quite obvious from the scenery. Uh, <laughs> apart from the fact it's cold, so I've, I've, I've got long COVID quite badly, so spending a lot of time in bed. This is kind of the first time I've 
been brave enough to uh, take part in one of these uh, things for a very long time. So I've I've um, asked uh, Ed um, or Louise, maybe you've got them, just if I get stuck, just to fire questions at me. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. It's great to be here and uh, really honoured to have been invited to take part. Thank you. It's almost a year, actually, since uh, I was released from Wandsworth Prison. Um, and and how, how did I get there? Um, well, uh, as Louise said, um, I, 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 I jumped into activism really with both feet. Um, I guess I have a reputation for that sort of being my MO in life. Um, I, I've taken a part, I, I've spent 35 years as a Paralympic athlete, um, taken part in five Paralympic Games, 18 World Championships, seven different disciplines. Um, so I guess sport's been a big part of my life and, and, and I guess I've always wanted to be the best I can be in whatever I do. Um, the, the, it, that applies to my work as well. Um, but when it came to um, discovery of the climate crisis, um, I, I, I couldn't do anything other than act. Um, and I was blissfully unaware, really, and I'm, I'm amongst many who've been campaigning for a lifetime, really, but I was, I was new to this in 2018. I met my daughter for a cup of coffee one morning and I could tell that she wasn't right and she broke down in tears and I said, what, what is wrong, Alice? You know, th this isn't you. And she said, oh, Dad, you know, I've been doing this geography degree, I've been studying, I've been reading up on the climate crisis and, and she told me some, some stuff she'd been reading last morning and I thought, oh my God, I had no idea. I've heard of this thing, but I had no idea this was so, 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 devastating uh, and a, an existential threat and and you know the 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 implications of the um, biodiversity and ecological crisis of course um so i was i was shocked and i i i i, I just I, I, at the time alice told me about extinction rebellion and i thought well you you can't do this on your own i'm with you i'm with you here so hand in hand arm in arm we were in tears going onto the bridges um a few days later for that famous occupation uh, so I was arrested 13, 14 times uh, in the course of a couple of years and um, uh, my arrest for climbing onto and gluing myself onto a, a plane at City Airport uh, landed me with a, um, a prison sentence at, at, at Wandsworth, HMP Wandsworth. Um, so I was sentenced to a year, as Louise said. Um, the way things work is that you serve six months and for it typically and the rest on license, but also then in addition to that, you can be released on tag. So for me, the reality would have been three months in prison, three months on tag. But on the 8th of December, I was released early by the Court of Appeal. So I've served two and a half months. Um, so what you know, how, how was prison? Um, I mean, okay, it's not somewhere you would go by choice, I guess. Uh, although I guess it was by choice in a way. One of the things something said to me, somebody said to me before my first arrest was just when you're in the cell, the police cell for the first time, tell yourself, remind yourself that you've chosen to be there um, and reconcile yourself with that decision. It's not something somebody's doing to you. So it's kind of inevitable if we as activists take these actions that some of us will end up in prison. I didn't, in my, I, I didn't really think a lot about the consequences when I climbed on the plane. It was a bit instinctive. Um, it, it wasn't planned. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, I was absolutely prepared for prison. So I wasn't surprised um, to be found guilty. Um, I wasn't surprised to be sent to prison. Um, it, it's, it's what you make of it. Um, I'm here, I've survived. I wouldn't like to go back again anytime soon, but I would if I had to. Um, and at the end of the day, um, just, you could say there, you know, you, you get your meals made. They're not great. You get, um, you know, you, you, you get, um, everything is pretty much everything you need to, 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 to deal with the basics is is provided 
it's not a place for reform or rehabilitation. It's a place for control and intimidation and bullying, and it's not pleasant. Um, and I and I think you know when it comes to how do people survive in prison, I think it's easier for some than for others. For me, as a disabled person, I had an additional several additional challenges, one being that the prison wouldn't allow me to have my glasses. Um, and uh, that that was quite something really to comprehend. Um, and, and it just, I think, illustrates how bonkers and how broken the prison system is. Um, you know, we were refused all access to any educational opportunities. What it says on the prison website is not what life is like in prison. Um, daily exercise, entitlement forget that we were lucky if we got out once a week um for 20 minutes um and we had 48 hour lock-ins in our cells so it was pretty grim but i had a good cellmate um i we had access to a phone um so i used that quite a lot and and um like i say yeah I'm, i i have huge respect for all of those who are now in prison or who are likely to to go into prison um and 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 I, I take my hat off to um, everyone who's stepping up at this point because it is absolutely necessary, and it's not really a question of whether um, whether you know prison. Uh, it, it, it's it's part of the theory of change, you know, and and I think I understood that, and, and that's that's a, a chapter in my life in a way. Um, so happy to answer any questions or, or if there's anything I've forgotten, um, Ed or, or Louise, that I put on my list of things that I thought I, I would um, share. That would be great. That's amazing. Um, was, was prison ever like a deterrent for you when you were thinking about taking the aeroplane action? And do you think that's a deterrent for people, you know, who want to take action to challenge the climate crisis now? I think folk uh, will think a lot about whether they take actions which may land them in prison but it won't put it, there'll be a certain number of folk who will not be put off um and who will not be put off no matter what the how harsh the penalty is and i see i think around me uh, as people become more and more frustrated um and uh distressed about the extent of the crisis and the lack of action i'm seeing more and more people stepping up and saying do you know what? I'm going to have to consider this as something that, that, that uh, as a part of my protest, uh, risk risking my liberty, risking a prison sentence. So uh, it, it wasn't a deterrent for me. It's emboldened me. It was a big part of my life. Um, I'm glad that it happened in lots of ways. Um, and I, I just have such admiration for those who are in prison and considering going to prison. Um, and you know, I, I, I it won't. It, you know, Sue Ella Braverman can, can, can ratchet it up as much as she wants, but, but that's not going to stop us. No way. Amazing. Thank you so much, James. I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah. Please. Thank you very much. <laughs> well done, you. <laughs> and you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think it goes to show that also. The, the experience of prison, it really does vary um, amongst people. For me, I think I had quite an easy ride compared to um, some others in this community, but I think we are seeing that a lot of the supporters of Just Up Oil are realising that, you know, whatever the consequences and experiences of prison, whatever they may be, it's just incomparable to what the climate crisis um, threatens us with. So it's a very difficult... <laughs> very difficult decision but it is a decision at the end of the day um so thank you very much um so the next speaker i i would like to introduce is carmody gray so carmody is an assistant professor in the department of religion and theology at durham university she has degrees in theology from trinity college oxford king's college cambridge and the university of nottingham and she has also written a book on the subject so welcome carmody Hello, everyone. Um, as always, it's a, um, an honor and a privilege to be in this um, this this gathering, this meeting. I've been spending the last few weeks recovering from COP twenty seven. Before COP twenty six, I got my my hopes up. 
the rhetoric was so high and uh, the evidence was so clear. And then COP26 was what it was. And I didn't really um, dare to watch COP27. I mean, I didn't follow it. I had a kind of grim sense of, of inevitability about it. That sounds very despairing, but I don't mean it in a despairing way. I somehow sensed that the same vested interests that have prevented action before would prevent it again. I was lucky enough once to hear Dr. Joseph Lee, who is the chair of the IPCC, talking about um, his interpretation of the situation. This is actually um, just over a year ago. And I was incredibly struck by the lack of drama in his presentation, his complete calm, his complete uh, evenness. And I was so angry at the time. And just a year later, I feel a bit more like him, a sort of lack of surprise. And that's not where I where I wanted to be. However, Copton 7 hasn't left me unchanged in my thinking. It has confirmed something I was already thinking, and I think all of you here understand that, but it's worth, I'd like to, to repeat it. I have myself in the past compared our current activity as a human family to an act of suicide. I've compared us to a crowd rushing towards the edge of a cliff and all saying that they wish they could change course, but they're not changing course and just rushing, rushing over the edge of the cliff. I now think that that's not only an untrue characterization of the situation, but not a helpful one. An act of suicide is when you kill yourself. But most people are not the agents of what is happening. They are not the perpetrators of the current situation. It's not the case that everyone is killing themselves. It's the case that some people are killing others. That's not suicide. That's just murder. Ordinary people everywhere who are informed feel desperately guilty about the situation. They feel that it's their fault, that every time they get in their car or go to the supermarket or something, that they're uh, part of the problem. I think that actually stops people from speaking up because they think they'll be accused of being hypocrites. Actually, I think that's one of the ways that the status quo is maintained, is that unless a person supposedly appears with a perfect personal track record, they don't have credibility to protest against the, uh, the ongoing use of fossil fuels. Saudi Arabia itself used that strategy at, at COP27. I now tell people that they shouldn't feel guilty. It's not the fault of individuals. We live our lives within uh, a constraining economic and social architecture that is not created by us. In other words, we're in a situation of intensely differentiated responsibilities. The CEO of BP has more responsibility than me. And I have more responsibility than a woman in Eritrea. Why? Because my chance to do something about this is greater than hers. And the CEO of BP's chance to do something about this is greater than mine. Why am I saying all of this now? Because it, it really is utterly confirmed by the recent actions of the UK government that a few people in power are holding the future hostage. Those who wish to stand up and say that system change should be pursued, that is to say we shouldn't embark on new fossil fuel extraction projects, are literally locked up. A clearer sign that those in power are not interested in serving the general interest could hardly be imagined. So I would like, I would like us to de-emphasize, if I may, our personal consumer habits. I think that that has played greatly into the hands of the people in power. It was BP who invented the term carbon footprint. They actually invented that to make it seem that the consumer was responsible. COP27 didn't fail because I didn't do my recycling.
COP27 failed because a few people who are benefiting enormously from the status quo are holding everybody else hostage. And that is basically fossil fuel companies and uh, fossil fuel producing states. We need people to change, to, to divert their energy from trying to reform their personal lives. People, people spend so much moral energy worrying about their personal behavior. And I'm not saying that that doesn't matter. Of course it matters. But it's a little bit like a choice between me asking, shall I give up smoking? And me asking, shall I make cigarettes too expensive to buy? It's not that I shouldn't give up smoking. It's that if it's important to stop everybody smoking, then the issue is not whether I'm smoking, it's how can I make cigarettes not a real option? The fact is that most, for most, this is, this is the, the offensive, outrageous thing. For most people, even in developed societies like the one that we're fortunate enough to live in, living in a non-environmentally destructive way is not really an option. Why? Because the people in power are profiting from maintaining the options in the way that they're currently set up. When you show up to the petrol station with your car, there's nothing to put in it except petrol. When you go to the supermarket, there's nothing to buy that doesn't have plastic on it. Now, some people think that by saying this, I'm this is a kind of council of despair and I'm saying nothing you do matters. That's not true at all. Of course it matters. Aside from anything else, <laughs> ultimately, and this is something I'll briefly touch on at the end, I think most of us deep down believe that there is some court in which we are judged, ultimately, in which what I do really does matter, even if that wasn't the highest impact thing, but it was the thing I had control over, and therefore it does matter what I do. I am personally answerable, answerable for whether I buy the thing covered in plastic or not. So I'm not saying it doesn't matter what we do, but I am saying in this absolutely critical moment, desperately, apocalyptically critical moment, don't let us not buy any of this absolute rubbish that the main thing is for me to do my recycling or for me to not take the plane and invest all of this huge heroic energy into trying to be a personal moral hero about my own consumer habits. That is not the issue. And that really suits the people running the show because they will go on creating the architecture in which we literally have to live, in which it is almost impossible to make choices that don't literally destroy our future. So, which I hope you can all hear, is an incredibly resounding act of encouragement, message of encouragement. Just a is doing the right thing. We need system change. We don't need individuals to go around having personal conversions. That may also be a very good thing to do. I hope everybody does. But that's actually, the, the patient is on life support. We don't have time for people to change their feelings. We need the entire system to change. And the only way to do that effectively, of course, is by resisting the system. I don't, I should revise that, sorry. I think there are other ways of applying pressure and we should use all the peaceful means at our disposal, every single one of them. Every single peaceful means of changing the system must be used. I don't want to speak too long, but there's, there's a couple more things I want to say. I've often, some of you probably will have heard me say that the environmental movement has been very obsessed with facts, when in fact facts don't change people. Information doesn't change anything, actually. And we know that from our personal life, if only we have a, a very casual glance at it, or indeed from the people that we know. But we certainly know it from the history of the environmental movement, which is that we've known the facts about global warming for 50 years. And still we're here looking at three degrees. What changes people's behavior is values. It's when we connect the values, connect the facts with the values, and that's when people act. What's the value? Quite simply, it's the survival of humanity. And there couldn't be a higher value. There's a dangerous distraction here. And I say that I'm not gonna have time to unpack this for you fully. So forgive me, this is very brief. It is not about saving nature. That has also worked greatly to the advantage of, of, uh, of, of the people in power. 
nature actually is going to still be there in 10,000 years. Some aspects of it won't be, and that's very tragic, but that's part of geological history as well. There were dinosaurs once upon a time, and they aren't here anymore. And by the way, the death of, you know, the, the tigers and the Great Barrier Reef, I mean, I like cry myself to sleep at night thinking about that. It's not about the fact that that's not terrible. It's that that's not the thing that is really at risk here. The thing that is at risk is us. The value that we need is, is love of humanity. It's love of each other. It's actually thinking that each other is worth saving. And that's what, you know, the government's actions, I'm sorry to say, indicate that they don't really think somehow. And speaking of prison and thinking of the people who are in prison, I would like to salute them because they have showed by what they've done how valuable human beings really are. That it's worth surrendering your freedom to make life possible for future human beings. And that is quite something. And I'm truly and deeply humbled by that. And every one of you here doesn't need me to explain that to you. That's why you're here. So, um, so I salute you all. And I hope that our, our imprisoned leaders are, are listening. I salute you. Thank you so much, Carmody. That was that was brilliant. I couldn't agree more with with basically everything you said. Um, my personal experience um, of the kind of media trashing me focused on, oh, well, she drives a car. She's using oil. You know, how how can she be you know against oil? And um, that is a, a key tactic the media and, and many people use is, you know, you, you, you are a hypocrite. So, you know, everything you say is meaningless. Um, forgetting the fact that it is the responsibility of governments um, to give individuals choices, just like you say. So I think that was a really important point to raise. Um, so thank you so much. Um, now I'm delighted to introduce Gabby. So Gabby Ditton is a non-violent resistor from Norwich, who's been on the front lines of climate resistance in the UK for three years. Yesterday, she was found guilty of criminal damage by a jury for breaking windows worth £97,000 at Barclays Bank in April 2021. And she will be sentenced on the 27th of January 2023, where she is expected to receive a prison sentence between six to 18 months. So welcome, Gabby. Hello. Um, oh, so much I want to say, but not enough time. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. I'm Gabby. I'm 28. Um, and yeah, I've been doing this stuff for about three years now and I feel really okay with it, actually. I thought, obviously, I was mildly devastated when we got the verdict yesterday. Um, but it, it, it was more sort of dismay at how far we've got to go, basically. And it was 11, 11 to 1 on the jury that found us guilty. And we really poured our hearts and souls out to them, you know, like we gave love and truth and everything that we had, and they still couldn't find them it in themselves to, to disobey the system, the system that said that they had to find us guilty. So it, that coming to terms with that was quite difficult, but I'm, I'm okay with it now. Um, and already there's been a lot of outrage about it and people, this kind of stuff does get people to step up and take action. Um, I spoke quite a lot in my witness statement and, um, closing statement about power, um, and about how as individuals, we like to think that there's nothing that we can do when actually, as individuals, I think we hold enormous power. And I think it was Nelson Mandela that said, our biggest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our biggest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And I think we all feel that sometimes. <laughs> sometimes when you really connect to what's going on, you're like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to do something insane. And then, and then that kind of feeling passes and you go back to being, um, you go back to, I say reality, I mean the system that we're living in where everything's fine and there's nothing to worry about and all of that. Um, but I definitely have those moments where um, there's nothing that I wouldn't do. Um, yeah, so that's that's fine. And 
I'm not so worried about going to prison. Um, a lot of people, I've, I've felt for a long time that that's where we needed to be when I first started doing stuff with Extinction Rebellion. I thought, why are we not filling the jails? <laughs> that would be the first on my list. Let's fill the jails, is what Gandhi said. And now seeing people doing it and people coming out and saying it wasn't horrific, as in it's doable, I think that's where, where we need to be, basically. So although it's really awful for the people that are in prison and I'm sure I'm not going to have a great time that's the, that's the worst they can do to us essentially the worst thing they can do to us is put is put us in prison and if we go in and go yeah whatever then there's nothing they can do essentially I mean they can trash us in the media they can call us hypocrites they can do all of these horrible things to us but ultimately at the moment until the law changes <laughs> all they can do is put us in prison if we're not afraid of that then then we're unstoppable, essentially. Um, so I'm strangely looking forward to it a little bit. Um, I was going to briefly just talk about um, next year with Just Stop Oil, if that was all right. Um, next year, hundreds of people are going to come together and we're going to go where the climate movement has never gone before, essentially. And it's going to be really, really, really scary. Um, but we're going to do it together and we're going to do it with love in our hearts for life, for humanity, for each other. And, and essentially we know that we don't have a choice in a way. Um, but I just wanted to reassure people that if you haven't taken action before, there's, there's not a single person that I know has ever regretted it. And most people or everyone that I know comes out a stronger and better person for having taken the action. And even after I'm in prison, I'm sure I won't regret it either. Um, so I can't tell you exactly what we're doing, but it's going to be very big and we need as many people as possible. And we're all going to go through it together. And we have our safety in numbers um, and we have everything to lose as well as nothing to lose. <laughs> so there's, um, we have to work through our fear barriers and we're gonna do it together and it's gonna be incredible. And I really hope you can join us essentially. Okay, that's all I'll say. I'll pass back to you, Louise. Thank you so much, Gabby. Um, so just to remind people, there is a poll on screen. What is your next step with Just Stop Oil? Um, you should be able to tick as many options as you like. Um, the options are donate, attend a non-violence training, take part in civil disobedience, which means taking action yourself and uh, being in a support role. So if you could place your vote, that'd be fantastic. Um, so now we're going to um, go into breakout rooms. So everybody will have two minutes to talk about how they've personally responded and felt about what they've just heard and what pathways to action you would like to do. Um, please make sure that everyone partake, partakes in active listening. So make sure you truly hear what each person has to say. Um, and there will be time if there is any time at the end that can be used then as a general discussion. But if everyone can try and watch the clock and keep two minutes each about what you feel about what you've just heard and what pathway to action you would like to do. Um, after the breakout rooms, we'll release another poll so you can answer what pathways to action you are taking on and nobody else in the Zoom will be able to see what answers you've put in the poll. So don't worry about that. But yeah, I'll just I'll just reiterate one last time the different pathways so you can donate. Um, so it would be amazing if you could donate, you know, one hour's wage every single month to help those mobilizing for, for Just Stop Oil and those taking action. We can't do this without funding. So that's the first way. Um, the second way is to engage and take part in civil disobedience yourself. So that is taking action, which can risk arrest, uh, which involves attending a non-violence training. And the third way is to be in a support role that could be leafleting, ringing people up, police station support, helping with fundraising and um, prison support as well. So there is a role for absolutely everybody. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. So we're going to go into breakout rooms now. So it should come up on your screen and you should be able to press join.